Hi, hello and welcome to this talk. My name is Michael Pradl. I'm a professor of computer science at the University of Stuttgart and I'm really excited about giving this keynote at ISTA 2022 on neural software analysis, the good, the bad and the ugly. So at a very high level, this talk is about program analysis. And because this is ISTA, the International Symposium on Software Testing and Analysis, of course, everybody knows what a program analysis is. So the question I'm interested in here is how to actually create a program analysis. So once we have identified a particular challenging problem to tackle with a program analysis, how do we go about creating the analysis that tackles this problem? The traditional answer to this question has been to manually craft a program analysis, which typically takes quite some time, a couple of months at least, and usually even more. If you want to get a practical analysis, it typically takes several years of work. Um, in order to do this, what traditional program analysis is using is precise and logical reasoning, but because of inherent limitations, such as the fact that basically every interesting program analysis problem um, is undecidable, of course, a practical program analysis also comes with um, some heuristics. These heuristics are typically created by a human who has looked at a lot of examples and has a good feel about what makes it difficult um, to solve the analysis problem. And then in order to compensate for these difficulties, some heuristics are typically added to um, the analysis. Another interesting property of traditional program analysis is that it's usually challenged by large code bases. So if there's more code, um, it's usually a bit of a problem, for example, because the analysis may not scale that well to large programs. Now, in this keynote, I want to talk about a different way of creating program analyses, which is neural software analysis. So the underlying insight of this line of work is, well, we actually have a lot of data about software, including, of course, a lot of source code and other artifacts associated with source code, um, which you can actually learn from. So let's do this learning and let's use a machine learning model for this. And to do this, essentially, the data that we have, for example, the source code, or maybe also execution traces or documentation or bug reports or any other kind of data associated with source code, um, is fed into a machine learning model, typically a neural network, which then gives you a predictive tool. And once you have trained the model, you can then give new code or new executions or new kind of data to this predictive tool, which then hopefully provides some information that is useful for developers. So let's compare this way of creating analyses with the traditional way of creating program analysis. So if you create a neural software analysis, then instead of manually crafting the analysis over several years of work, it's learned automatically within hours or maybe days, depending on the hardware and the amount of data that you have and the model that you're using. Instead of precise and logical reasoning, um, the analysis is built in a data-driven form by basically learning from the data what to predict. Of course, a neural software analysis also contains a lot of heuristics, probably even more than a traditional program analysis, because in a sense, it's all just heuristics, but these heuristics are not manually encoded, but automatically learned um, from the data. And finally, the perhaps most interesting part of this is that instead of being challenged by large code bases, neural software analysis actually turns this problem into part of the solution by learning from these large code bases, um, because more code is basically better in order to um, yeah, learn a stronger analysis. So this overall idea of neural software analysis is actually pretty recent. Um, and uh, what I want to show in this little plot here is how this idea in this whole field has been evolving over the past few years. So the first neural analysis really came out around 2015. And then it took the community a while to uh, yeah, explore these ideas further. And a few years ago, um, there really has been an explosion of um, neural software analyses. Um, and by now we have a significant fraction of all papers that get submitted and also accepted at the major conferences um, being basically um, some form of neural software analysis. Uh, people have been looking at many, many different problems, including, for example, type prediction, bug detection, program repair, um, or code summarization and code completion. There are many, many more that I'm not listing here, but this is just to give uh, an idea of the scope of problems that people have been looking at in this field so far. Of course, it's not only academics. Um, despite its young age, neural software analysis has already found its way into practice. And just to give two examples, let me mention two code completion systems. 
um, Tab9, which was released already in 2018, uh, and Copilot, which was released a bit more than a year ago. Um, both of them essentially are trained on lots of source code and then um, help developers by being a code completion system that is integrated into an IDE and the whole um, uh, completion works because there's a predictive model that is able to predict the next piece of code a developer is most likely to write. So in this talk I want to look at this field from three perspectives, the good, the bad and the ugly. And I'm going to start with the good, which is basically sh showing two examples of successful neural software analyses that address a bug detection problem and uh, a type prediction problem. So let's start with a concrete piece of code um, as a bit of motivation. So this is some Python code taken from some machine learning uh, code base. And if you look at this for a while, um, you might figure out that something is wrong. So just let everybody stare at this for a few seconds and people using Python regularly probably figure out that something is wrong here. The problem is that um, the very first line computes um, a value that is supposed to be, uh, be the size of a training data set, but this, result, um, this results in a floating point value instead of an integer. And when this floating point value is then used in the third line to slice this data array, um, there's going to be a crash of the program because you just can't slice an array um, with a floating point as the, as the index. A second completely unrelated problem is the one that you see down here. So this shows a piece of code that checks whether some file exists and then stores the result of this check into a variable called file. Um, now with this code, there's nothing really wrong in the sense of a correctness bug but the name file is pretty misleading if you think about it because um, you typically would not store a boolean in a variable called file um, because files are just that it's actually a file pointer or maybe the name of a file, but not really a boolean value. And what these two examples have in common is that there's a name and a value that is um, referred to by this name and the two are actually not consistent with each other. So the goal of the neural software analysis that I'm going to give as an example here is to find such name value inconsistencies. And in order to do this, there are actually three pretty hard challenges that we need to address. Challenge number one is to understand the meaning of names. So as a human, you typically have an intuition about what a variable name means, but of course a program analysis does not have this kind of intuition. Challenge number two is to understand the meaning of values. Again, as a skilled human, so a software developer, you look at a value and you have some idea of what it means, but again, a traditional program analysis doesn't really have this kind of understanding. And then challenge number three, it's to precisely pinpoint unusual combinations of uh, names and values so that they can be reported to a developer um, so that the developer can have a look at it. So to achieve this goal, um, we have developed a technique called Nailin, and um, you can see an overview of this technique here. As many of the uh, techniques in this neural analysis space, it consists of two phases. So first, there's a training phase during which we are essentially training a neural network. And then we have a prediction phase where we are using the trained network to make some hopefully interesting predictions. The input to all of this are executable programs. And that's a little different from a lot of other work in this space, because here we do not just look at code, but we actually execute the code in order to learn from its runtime behavior. So given these executable programs, there is a dynamic analysis of assignments that happen in the program. So basically all the places where values are bound to names. What we'll get out of this um, dynamic analysis are pairs of names and values, which we consider to be correct or consistent um, because most of the programs we look at are probably okay. In order to um, also have negative examples so that we can at the end learn a classifier that distinguishes between the consistent and the inconsistent examples. We also have a technique for generating these ne negative examples from positive examples, which I will not talk about in more detail here. And then given these two kinds of examples, we're training a neural model which classifies um, a pair of a name and a value as either consistent or inconsistent which can then be queried in order to find out name value inconsistencies in the program that we haven't seen before. So let's look a little bit more into the dynamic analysis we perform to extract the data that is eventually given to the model. So it's basically um, a source-to-source -source instrumentation, in our case for Python, 
that adds a little bit of instrumentation code around every assignment. So basically every place where a name is bound to a value. Um, so for each such assignment, we're extracting five pieces of information. First, the name that is on the left-hand side of the assignment, so typically the name of a variable. Second, a string representation of the value that is assigned to this name. And the reason for looking at a string representation is that developers also pretty commonly look at it, for example, when just logging some um, information about a program state. And then we also extract as the last three um, properties, some features of values that um, might be of interest, for example, the type of a value, the length of a value, and the shape of a value. To give you some examples, um, here's a little table of um, yeah, names and uh, values and properties of values that we have extracted. So each row in this table is one particular um, uh, name of a variable, for example, age, and then some information about the value that was assigned to this, to this variable. Once we've extracted such examples of names and values, along with some properties of the values, um, we are also creating negative examples in a way that is shown in the paper, and then give these positive and negative examples as training data to a neural classification model. And this is what you see here on the slide. So the neural classification model essentially takes these five pieces of information and encodes each of them into a vector using a, su a suitable um, representation. So for the name, for example, we are embedding the name um, using a pre-trained fast text model. Um, the string representation of the value is encoded using a GRU and a CNN, so a recurrent neural network and a convolutional neural network. And then uh, similarly, the type and the length and the shape are also encoded into vector representations. And then all these vector representations are concatenated into one long vector, which is then given to um, a couple of feed forward layers that at the end predict the probability that this combination of a name and a value um, is inconsistent. And then during training, we are basically trying to nudge the model to predict um, zero for the consistent examples, so for the positive examples that we've taken from the uh, given code, and we nudge it to predict uh, inconsistent, so one um, for the examples that we have created as negative examples, so that at the end, the model is able to distinguish between these two. Without going into further details about how the approach works, uh, feel free to look it up in the paper. Let me just mention a few highlights of the evaluation. So we have implemented this um, idea for Python and then applied it to Jupyter Notebooks because they are more or less self-contained and more or less executable pieces of, of Python code. Um, the classifier that we train at the end is uh, pretty accurate. So it gets an F1 score of 89%. Um, we also show that Nayland's predictions of inconsistent name, values, pa name value pairs um, overlap a lot with um, what software developers consider to be um, hard to understand names, um, which we show through a user study. And we also compare Nalin to existing static checkers. Again, more details on the paper. Let me also mention a few of the uh, kinds of inconsistencies that um, this kind of approach is able to find. So we manually inspected um, 30 of the warnings uh, reported by Nalin and classified them into three uh, groups. The largest of these three groups is misleading names. Um, you see one example here where a variable called name initially stores a name, which is a good fit, but then later on stores um, a value 2.5, which is not a good fit and a pretty unusual combination, which a developer should probably um, have a look at in order to choose a better name or maybe check if the value should actually be assigned to this name. The second uh, kind of inconsistency that we find are incorrect values. So places where not the name is wrong, but the value is wrong. And one example is what you see here, where um, a variable called prop, which probably means probability, um, um, actually stores a string that has nothing to do with, with a probability. And later in the code, um, this incorrect value actually leads to a crash because the string is compared to a floating point value, which in Python um, leads to an exception. Finally, there are also a few false positives because all of this is learned from data. There's no guarantee, of course, to be 100% uh, precise. Um, here you can see one of the false positives where the model is somewhat misled by the name dwarf, where the F um, is uh, a capital F, um, and this 
probably stands for file, but the model failed to understand this. But because a human might actually understand it from the context, we classify this as a false positive. So now looking at these examples, you might actually ask, well, wouldn't a type checker actually find many of these problems? Because they are somewhat type related. And the answer is um, yes, a type checker would find these problems, but there's a problem. And this problem is that um, we're talking about code written in a dynamically typed language, which means most of this code is actually not annotated with type annotations. Um, and this is um, a general problem because there's a lot of code written in JavaScript, Python, and other dynamically typed languages, most of which currently at least is not annotated with type annotations, even though the language actually allows people to do this. So in the following, I want to look at the second problem that neural software analysis has been applied to and where it's pretty successful, which is how to automatically add type annotations to code bases that currently don't have type annotations. Of course, you can have different approaches, not just uh, neural software analysis. So let's look at some options here. Option number one is static type inference. So you have um, an algorithm that guarantees by design that the types it's going to add um, are correct. Um, in practice, unfortunately, static type inference is relatively limited, in particular for languages like Python or JavaScript that turn out to be relatively hard to analyze statically. Option number two is dynamic type inference. So you can, of course, run the code and then observe the types at runtime and then add these types that you've observed um, as type annotations to the code. Um, one obvious downside of this kind of dynamic analysis is that you need some inputs in order to run the code. And another problem is that not all the types that you see um, at, at runtime, um, maybe uh, the entire type that you want a variable to be annotated with because sometimes a variable um, should have a more general type annotation than one specific type that you see um, during one execution. The third option and in this um, uh, group of um, approaches uh, falls uh, neural software analysis is probabilistic type prediction. So here you have for example a neural model that is trained on existing type annotations so code that already has been annotated and then learns to predict missing type annotations for code that is still missing annotations. One interesting class of probabilistic type prediction approaches are neural models. And in the past, there have been a couple of approaches um, proposed for this purpose. What they all have in common is basically the same overall um, structure. So there's a neural model that gets trained on some information about the code, for example, identifiers of variables and functions, other natural language information that is associated with the code, such as comments, um, but of course also the code itself, for example, represented as a sequence of tokens. And then given this information, the neural model um, is able to predict type annotations, which can then be um, written into the code. So now it turns out that if you train a neural model um, to predict type, type annotations, and even if the model gets a relatively high accuracy, um, there's still some interesting challenges that um, you need to face in order to make such an approach practical. One challenge is that the predictions will always be imprecise, right? So the, the model will never be 100% correct. So some predictions will be wrong. And if you think about a huge code base with many missing type annotations, then this essentially means that the developers must decide which suggestions to follow um, from those that are given um, by the model. And now if you think one step further, this um, leads to the second challenge, which is a combinatorial explosion of the different options to consider. Because basically for each missing type, you have one or more suggestions. So you could take this suggestion or that suggestion, or maybe none at all because they all don't fit. But um, exploring all the combinations of these different suggestions is just practically impossible if you have a larger code base. So let me illustrate this uh, using a concrete example. So here you see um, a Python function that uh, takes an argument called color, then computes something and at the end returns some value. And then there's another function that is actually used by the first function. Now without having to look in detail at what this code is doing, um, if you feed this into a state-of-the-art neural model for type prediction, you will get a list of predictions. For example, the model might say that the parameter color um, should have type int, or if that's not correct, then the second most likely option would be string, and the third most likely type would be bool. 
And similarly for the return type of this function, we'll also get a list of suggestions and the same for the return type of the second function. Now the problem is if you just naively take the topmost prediction for each of these missing type annotations and see if this is actually a correct way to type annotate this uh, piece of code, then you will get some type errors because the annotations are actually inconsistent with each other. And instead, what you would like to have is, in this case, the second suggestion for the color parameter, the second suggestion for the first return type, and the first suggestion for the second return type. So now, of course, you do not want to um, do this manually. And instead, um, the approach um, that we've been working on called Typewriter tries to automate both parts. So getting this uh, ranked list of suggestions and then finding the right combination of the suggestions that you may want to add to your code. So here you see an overview of this uh, typewriter approach. So the input is a program where some or maybe even all type annotations are still missing. And then the first um, big box is a probabilistic type prediction model, so a neural network trained to predict types. Um, we'll see um, a little bit more how this works, but on a very high level, it's basically applying a very lightweight static analysis to extract um, two types of information, some natural language information, such as identifier names and comments, and also some programming language information, and then feeds all of this into a neural type prediction model. And then what you get from this model is this list of um, ranked, uh, this ranked list of uh, type predictions for each annotation that is currently missing. And then the second part of the typewriter approach is to search for a combination of types that at the end is consistent with each other. And in order to do this, we're actually using the fact that we have a traditional program analysis, namely a static type checker, that is really good at telling us whether um, a set of type annotations is consistent with each other. And then we use this type, taker, a type checker um, and combine it with a feedback directed search in order to find um, the right combination of types to be added to the program. And then at the end, what typewriter returns is the program as it was before, but now with additional uh, type annotations that are guaranteed to be type correct. So let's have a look at the information that the static analysis extracts um, for the example that we've just seen. So on the one hand, it's gonna extract natural language information, such as the names of functions and the names of um, parameters. It's also going to look at um, comments, in particular function level comments, because it turns out that developers very often um, annotate um, the types already in these comments, but in an um, informal or at least not uh, formally uh, standardized way. But if you give this information to a neural model, it can actually make pretty good use of it. On the other side, um, we also extract programming level um, information. In particular, we are looking at all the occurrences of the code element that we would like to type and then extract the code tokens around these occurrences. So if you want to type, for example, um, the color parameter, we will look at tokens around occurrences of color and similarly for um, the return types. And then as a final piece of information, we also look at imports in the file where we want to add type annotations because these imports give you an idea about what classes and types are relevant in this file. So once all this information is extracted, um, we are feeding it into a neural network, which um, again uses different encoders in order to vectorize um, the given data. So for the code tokens, um, we use a pre-trained token embedding and then feed this into an RNN, a recurrent neural network, which basically summarizes the entire sequence of code tokens into one vector. Um, similarly for the identifiers and the comments, just that here we use a different pre-trained embedding model that is pre-trained for natural language words. Again, everything is summarized into a vector. And then all the information is uh, again combined into um, a, big, um, a big vector and given to uh, some hidden layers, which at the end produce uh, what we call the type vector. And this is basically a probability distribution over a fixed set of types that um, we are interested in. So by default for typewriter, um, this set contains the 1000 most common types in the code base so that the model basically says for each of these 1000 types, what the probability is that this is the right type or that is the right type or that is the right type at a given code location. So once this neural model is trained and uh, is able to more or less accurately predict the right types, um, 
we get this list of top K predictions for each missing type. And now the second step of the approach is to search in these lists of predictions for a combination of types that is consistent with each other so that at the end we can add annotations to the program that still um, make the program uh, or leave the program to be type correct. To do this, we filter the predictions uh, using a gradual type checker. These type checkers exist for Python, for example, Pya and MyPy, but also for other languages like Flow for, for JavaScript. Now, it turns out that this is a combinatorial search problem because you have um, some number of missing types, um, which we call type slots, and then you have some other number um, of predictions for the slot. And if you look at the number of combinations um, of um, possible type assignments, um, for um, for these type slots, then you will see that this is actually a pretty large number, which turns out to be too large to um, explore exhaustively. So instead of exploring this exhaustively, um, we are making use of um, a search algorithm, which is guided by um, some feedback function. And the goal of this feedback function is to basically minimize the number of missing types without introducing any new type errors. So we encode this into uh, a numeric feedback score, which combines um, two pieces of information. The first is the number of missing types, so that's the n missing. And the second is the number of errors that we have, which is um, this n errors. And of course, we can um, weight these two um, pieces of information. So by default, we give a higher weight um, to errors so that we basically don't add a type and also add an error but um, try to um, really minimize the number of missing types without introducing um, any type errors. So let's just have a look at our example again and see how this works. So as shown before, we get this list of predictions from the neural model. And as shown before, if we would just naively add the topmost prediction for every type annotation, we actually get some type errors. So now um, in this case, we get two type errors. So we know that um, things are not as good yet as we want them to be. And then our search algorithm tries out um, other types. So basically going down the list at particular um, type slots, maybe tries out the second type annotation for the um, color parameter, which actually removes one of the type errors. So we know that this was a good move. And then if you also um, use the second option for the return type, um, then you actually get a consistent assignment of types which, as shown by the type checker, will um, be type correct. Great, so without um, going into more details about the approach, um, if you're interested again, please have a look at the corresponding paper. Let me mention a few words about the evaluation. So this was some work that I've done during a sabbatical at Facebook. So one of the code bases we applied this to was all the Python code that Facebook had at this point in time. And we also ran it on uh, almost 6 million lines of open source code. Um, the neural model, once it's trained, um, is able to predict types with an 80% F1 score within its top five predictions. So that's pretty good. But again, if you wouldn't have the search, um, you, someone would have to basically find the right combination combinations of types. But if we run our automated search, then typewriter is able to correctly annotate 75% of all missing types um, in a given file. We also compare typewriter to a traditional static type inference and show that in practice it basically subsumes what the static type inferences, uh, inference is able to do. So, so far I've talked about the good parts of neural software analysis where I just picked two examples of where this kind of analysis works pretty well. There are many more of these examples. Um, I just happened to pick two that um, I've been familiar with because we've worked on them. Let's now move on to um, the bad parts um, of, this, of this field, um, where I'm going to reflect a little bit about um, when it makes sense to actually apply this kind of analysis. So looking at the success stories, um, one might say, well, let's just address all program analysis problems using a neural software analysis. And I would like to argue that this is not the right way to do it, because there's some problems that are really well suited for um, neural software analysis and some others which we just should leave to uh, traditional analysis simply because um, such an analysis um, is better um, in achieving what we want to achieve. And what's also very important and the community sometimes seems to um, not, not fully be aware of that is that we should focus on the important problems, meaning the problems that are important to software developers 
instead of those problems where we happen to have a lot of data. So sometimes people build models that map A to B simply because we have a lot of A-B pairs in some data set, but it's maybe not the most important problem um, for developers. So instead of just addressing any kind of program analysis problem you can think of using a neural software analysis, um, let's be a little bit more careful in deciding when to actually apply this kind of analysis. So to give some guidance about um, when to use and not use neural software analysis, um, we've been thinking about this a little bit and came up with three dimensions that are related to the fuzziness of the information that is available to you, also related to whether you have some well-defined correctness criterion, and finally, of course, related to the data that you could learn from. So let's go through these uh, three criteria one by one and look a little bit more into what uh, I mean here. So let's start by looking at criterion number one, which is about the fuzziness of the information that is available um, in the problem domain that um, you want to address some uh, program analysis problem in. So the spectrum goes from having very precise information on one hand and having very fuzzy information on the other hand. Um, and to make this a little bit more concrete, um, let's say you're able to formulate a rule of the form that if your code has some property A, then some other property B must hold, then this is very precise information, right? So that's one end of the spectrum. On the other hand are problems where you might be able to say that, well, if your code is similar to some pattern A, then there's a chance that B um, holds, right? So this is very fuzzy information. And depending on where you are in the spectrum, um, you may want to uh, use traditional program analysis or maybe neural program analysis. Neural program analysis is really good at reasoning about fuzzy information. We've just seen two examples of this, where the fuzzy information is essentially in the form of natural language, um, which is inherently fuzzy, and that's why neural software analysis is a good choice. But there are other problems where you have the ability to um, precisely formulate strict rules because you have precise information in your hands. Um, and in this case, maybe traditional program analysis is actually the better way to go. All right, let's move on to uh, criterion number two, which is about the fact whether you have a well-defined correctness criterion. So for some problems um, in program analysis, you actually have a specification you can check um, a solution against. On uh, this end of the spectrum is, for example, type checking, where um, you have usually a set of, of type rules that allow you to precisely say whether a program um, is uh, type correct or not. On the other hand of the spectrum, um, you have problems where you do not really have such a correctness criterion, but ultimately a human needs to decide what is the right way to go. And um, examples here are basically all problems related to the naturalness of code. So for example, the question whether an identifier name is a good fit for a particular value, because it would be a natural way to name this um, identifier. So again, um, each spectrum has its kind of analysis. So if you um, have a well-defined correctness criterion or some, or some kind of specification to check a solution against, um, then a traditional analysis is probably the best way to go. So for example, I think it doesn't really make sense to have a type checker that is based on a trained uh, neural network. But on the other hand, if you have um, no such correctness criterion and you actually need some human intuition in order to decide what the right solution is, then a neural analysis um, is a good way um, to address the problem. The third criterion for deciding whether a neural software analysis is a good um, choice, and that's perhaps the most obvious one, is about data. So for some problems, you just inherently have very little data that is available, whereas for others, there may be a lot of data um, um, available. So just as examples, anything that requires some sort of human interaction, let's say um, records of people debugging code, um, is a problem where you inherently have little data available and it's relatively hard to get a lot of data. Whereas, for example, code completion is a prime example of a problem where you have lots of data available. And surprise, surprise, that's why code completion is um, one of these problems for which we have already um, deployed solutions that are in industrial practice um, even today. So again, um, if you're more on the left side of the spectrum, um, then a traditional analysis is maybe the better way to go. Whereas if your problem is more on the right side of the spectrum, 
then you should probably go for a neural software analysis. Um, looking a little bit more into the data, um, what you really want to have is a data set that is both realistic and has relatively little noise. Um, not all data sets that the community is focusing on these days has, this, uh, has these two properties. So we should be aware of the fact that we really want a realistic data set and not just one that we can easily get from somewhere. Uh, and at the same time, a low noise data set so that we have some confidence into um, whatever we can conclude at the end um, from the results on this data set. And um, somewhat obvious, but maybe still worth mentioning, um, it should also be for a task that developers really care about, right? So please, 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 um, dear fellow researchers, don't train models just because we have the data, but focus on problems that developers really care about. So putting these three dimensions together basically gives you some guidance about when to use and when not to use neural software analysis. And when the next program analysis problem comes your way, um, it's, it's probably worth thinking a little bit about whether it is a good fit for neural software analysis. And if yes, then please, please uh, exploit the potential of this uh, interesting field. And if not, then maybe think about whether there's another approach that might be a better fit here. All right, let's now move on from the bad part, which I hope wasn't that bad after all, to the ugly part of uh, neural software analysis. So let's see what that is about. Well, the ugly side of things is that we sometimes don't really know what these models are learning and we don't really understand why these models are actually working. Sometimes it feels a little bit like being one of these alchemists that uh, a couple of hundreds of years ago tried to find some substance by basically putting together different uh, substances they already had. And sometimes they find or they found what they wanted to find uh, and sometimes they didn't. And working on neural models of code and neural models of, of software in general sometimes feels a little bit like this, unfortunately. Now, of course, this is not ideal to put it mildly, um, um, a, because it's intellectually unsatisfying. If you just don't understand why the thing you are creating is actually working, um, that doesn't really um, satisfy the, the intellectual appetite that we as researchers probably have. Um, and B, um, there's a risk of coincidentally high um, accuracy because maybe a model just picks up some um, correlation in the data set and then gives you really good numbers, but actually it's not really addressing the problem that you wanted to address. Addressing this challenge of understanding what models are really doing um, is a long-term problem that um, yeah, we're not going to solve in the next few years, I believe at least. Um, but let's take, um, yeah, let's, let's try to make some progress step by step. And as one of these steps, um, I'd like to share an idea that we've recently started to work on, which is essentially about comparing humans and neural models while they are trying to achieve the same task. So one commonality of um, basically all the tasks that um, we are training neural models of, of software to achieve is that these tasks can also be achieved by humans, right? It's just about automating it so that at the end um, we can um, yeah, solve these problems in a, in a more, more efficient and also cheaper way, but ultimately developers would also be able to do it. So, well, what can we do? We can just compare humans performing this task to models performing this task. So basically what um, we, we've been doing in a couple of experiments is to give both developers and neural models of code exactly the same task, exactly the same inputs, in this case code examples, and then we measure how they compare um, to each other. And in particular, what we measure um, um, in the experiments I'm going to talk about is what parts of the code the humans and the models are paying attention to and how effective they are at solving the task. This general idea of comparing uh, humans and models could of course be realized for many different tasks. The task that uh, we focus on here is code summarization, which is about getting a piece of code like this uh, body of a Java method that you see here, and then producing a concise summary of what this uh, code is actually doing, which in this case um, is just predicting the name of the method um, that this piece of code should have. So in this example, um, the name should be update state, which just happens to be the real name that this method had before uh, it was cut off for the example. So we use here a data set of 250 such methods from different Java projects, which was yeah, gathered by um, a previous uh, piece of work. 
So now in order to understand what the model and the human um, are doing when they analyze this code in order to summarize it, we are capturing the attention of the humans and of the models. Um, so our goal is to um, track basically where a human is looking while trying to figure out how to summarize um, a piece of code. Now in order to do this, you could uh, take different um, approaches. The one that we took here is to have an unblurring based web interface where initially the developer sees all the code blurred. So you, um, you can basically see that there's some code and you may understand um, um, how long the code is, but you don't really see the details. But then once you start moving your mouse or your cursor um, over the code, you can temporarily unblur particular tokens. And by doing this, we can basically see where people pay attention to because they keep going back or maybe just unblur something for longer because that seems relevant to the humans. So just to show you how this looks like, here's a screenshot um, of the web interface. So what you see on the right is basically the code inspection area where all the code is displayed, but by default in a blurred way. And then once someone moves the cursor, um, um, the code gets unblurred. And on the left, you see the answer selection area where once um, the participant, the human participant has figured out what the name should probably be, um, um, he or she can pick out of seven different options um, that we've prepared um, to, to indicate what the right name for this piece of code should be. So we've used this interface to uh, capture human attention data from 91 participants, um, yeah, different people, undergrads, graduate students, and also some crowd workers. Um, in total, this gives us about 1500 human attention records. Um, we have at least five records for each of the 250 uh, Java methods. And on average, in each of these records, there are about 1200 different mouse token events, so different events where a mouse um, the mouse was moved and some particular token was either blurred um, or unblurred. So it's quite a lot of data, um, which uh, we can then use now to uh, compare it to attention by models. To capture the attention of models, we can just exploit the fact that neural models often use an attention mechanism. Um, so we, we here look at two uh, code summarization models, one that uses a convolutional network, another one that is based on transformers. And both of them provide two kinds of attention mechanisms. So on the one hand, they provide regular attention, which is basically telling us where the model looks in order to um, come up with its predictions. And then on the other hand, they provide copy attention, which basically tells us where the model, models are looking um, in order to figure out which tokens or subtokens to copy to the output, so to the predicted method name. So now given the two attention vectors, those that we get from the humans and those that we get from the models, we can now compare them and compute the agreement between the models and the humans in terms of where in the code they look. And we do this by basically uh, comparing these two attention vectors using Spearman rank correlation. Let's have a look at the results and maybe to set a baseline, let's start with the agreement among humans. So this is the human-human agreement. Um, let me explain how to interpret these plots. So basically what you see here is the distribution of the Spearman rank coefficients, where everything that is more toward the right means that there is higher agreement and everything that is more toward the left means there is lower agreement. And what you see here is that the developers agree among each other um, in a pretty um, strong way. So the, the mean um, uh, uh, Spearman rank coefficient is uh, 59%, so there's a relatively high agreement between the humans. Now let's have a look at uh, humans versus models, and let's start with the copy attention. Um, so what you see here are the results for two different models, one on the top, the other on the bottom. And uh, again, we see a relatively high agreement, not as high as um, between humans, but still um, around 50%, so that's still um, relatively high. And our way to interpret this is that this is actually an empirical justification for using copy attention because um, the models um, that use copy attention seem to do something that is very similar to humans um, when they uh, inspect the same code. Now let's have a look at the regular attention and here the picture um, looks quite different. So again, you see the two models, one on the top and one at the bottom. And what you can see is that the overall agreement is pretty low. Uh, I mean, it's around 8% for the model at the, at the top and it's even negative. Uh, so actually disagreement for the model at the bottom. So it seems there's quite a lot of room for improvement if we want to make 
um, uh, neural models um, look at similar tokens as human developers. To better understand what kinds of tokens um, models and humans focus on the most, we classify tokens into different kinds like identifiers and separators and so on. And then for each kind, compute a metric called distance from uniformity. Zero in this metric means that the attention paid to a particular kind of token is basically the same as you would get if you would pay uniform attention to all tokens. If the value is negative, it means it's less than uniform. And if the value is positive, it means that um, the model or the human is paying more um, attention to a particular kind of token than you might expect from a uniform distribution. Given this metric, let's have a look at uh, the results and let me first explain how to, how to read this plot. So the different colors correspond to different models and different attention mechanisms in the model, plus the green bar, which is for the humans. And then um, one below another, you see different kinds of tokens, identifiers, separators, keywords, and so on. And now every bar that goes to the right means that the model or the human pays um, um, yeah, more attention than you might expect from a uniform distribution um, to this kind of token, whereas a bar that goes to the left means um, little attention is actually paid to this kind of token. So one interesting thing we can see here is that identifiers are considered to be important both by um, um, the models we look at and by the humans, which sort of confirms this intuition that identifiers are actually pretty um, useful when reasoning about source code. Another interesting finding is that there are some kinds of tokens that the human developers consider to be important, but the models seem to mostly ignore, right? So the only bar that goes to the right is the green one, the ones from the humans, but all the models go to the left, so they actually don't really look at these tokens. And in particular, this includes keywords, operators, and strings. To even better understand this result, um, let's have a look at a concrete example. So what you see here are two attention maps for the same piece of code. So on the top, it's the attention paid by one of the neural models, whereas on the bottom, you see the attention paid by the humans um, when also looking at this code. And I mean, if you just compare the two visually, you already see that they are pretty different, um, which compares the, the result I've um, presented earlier on. And when you look a little bit more at the details, you, for example, see that the model is paying quite a bit of attention to very syntactic um, kinds of tokens like semicolons and curly braces. And one of the reasons probably is that the models see the code just as a sequence of tokens. So they do not have any information about the structure of the code, but need to spend or maybe waste their attention to recovering um, the syntactic information. Another interesting um, finding from this is that the model uh, completely ignores some tokens that are considered pretty important by developers. In this case, for example, these string literals, which are uh, yeah, considered as very important by the developers, but not considered at all by the model. So now we've seen whether models and humans agree or disagree, and uh, we've seen that they do not always agree. So in the final question, we are asking whether models are more effective when they agree more with developers? And if the answer to this would be yes, then probably we should try to make the models a bit more like the human developers. So to answer that question, um, we basically look at different subsets of all the methods in our data set. So on the left, in the yellow box, um, you see the results for all methods, whereas on the right, you see results for um, those methods where the models make particularly accurate predictions, so where the F1 scores of the predictions are uh, above 0 0.5. And now what you see in the table um, are the uh, human model agreements for these different subsets. And what you can see is that when you go from the left column to the right, all the values are getting higher, which basically means that more human-like predictions um, also correlate with more accurate um, predictions, so basically models that are more human-like make better predictions. So what are the implications of this, um, of this work? Well, one implication is that this direct comparison of humans and models actually is a pretty neat way to understand at least a little bit what these models are doing and how this maybe differs from humans uh, working on the same task. And the second takeaway is that we should probably create models that more closely try to mimic humans. So one way of doing this could be to use human attention during training, or another way of doing this could be to design models explicitly for weaknesses identified by this direct uh, comparison, 
for example, by training a model that is designed to understand string literals. All right, before coming to the end, let's uh, try to look a li little bit into um, what future work uh, could be in this field. So one interesting um, line of work are general purpose language models, for example, Codex, um, which turn out to be really powerful. And I expect more work um, on this kind of model, um, potentially also for tasks for which we had special purpose models um, um, in the past. Another very interesting direction is to combine the power of neural software analysis with that of the power of traditional program analysis. Um, we've seen a little bit of exploration there um, already, for example, the typewriter work that I've presented earlier, but I think a lot could be, um, a lot more could be done um, at this intersection of these two kinds of analyses. And finally, another currently a little bit underdeveloped subfield of neural software analysis are models that reason about executions. Um, so instead of just looking at code, um, also looking about the execution of code um, is probably a very um, fruitful direction. All right, and that already brings me to my conclusion. So I've talked about neural software analysis, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So on the good side, we've seen that neural software analysis can be pretty effective for tasks such as bug detection and type prediction. On the bad side, I've argued that it's probably not a good idea to use neural software analysis for all program analysis problems, and I try to lay out some um, criteria for choosing whether neural software analysis is actually a good fit. And then on the ugly side, we've seen this problem of not really understanding what these models are doing and a very first step um, towards uh, addressing this problem. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions either directly in the Q&A um, after this talk or otherwise by email or any other means uh, of communication. Thank you very much.